Uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, I'm Jim O'Halloran with uh, Roosevelt Neighborhood Association. I'm um, one of the guys behind the Land Use Academy. Um, how many people have been to any of the other, how many people went to the 201, the last thing we had, some of you? How many people went to the 101 session at the Bull Moose Festival? Who is at both of those so far? Oh, these are the true citizens, right? Uh, thanks for coming out. I, I know that schedules are always a challenge, but uh, we're grateful for your participation, and we've had good participation with this event. So I'm just going to kick things off uh, and then tell you what we're doing. We've got um, a different type of session today. The Land Use Academy, as you probably know, and there's information in the packets, is all about empowering the community and allowing us to, to make some you know, quality, reasoned input into important land use decisions for the Roosevelt community. There's three big topics, at least, but the three big ones that we see are the redevelopment of the high school blocks uh, and also the potential repurposing of the Roosevelt Reservoir, uh, and then also uh, the TOD sites, the transit-oriented development, the, the land around the future light rail station. And that's the topic of today's meeting. In order to get to each of these topics, we've had two preliminary meetings, as you know, and, and one uh, at the, the Bull Moose Festival in July was really kind of a review. This is where we've been, the history of land use planning in Roosevelt. I uh, had a number of good speakers. The agenda is in the package, just as a refresher. The 201 meeting was intended to introduce some other topics, and we had another great round of speakers in this room last month, uh, maybe helping us to understand some other thoughts. So I had a guy from the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, and I think, uh, just as an example, a number of folks found that interesting. I mean, to what extent should those type of cultural issues influence our land use ideas? So where we're heading with all of this for each of the three large topics which I mentioned is um, uh, the establishment of at least a preliminary position by the Roosevelt Neighborhood Association. We will, we will create you know, a simple document, a position paper, if you will, which attempts to capture and distill the community input. So we, we've had the two background meetings. Those were mainly listening sessions. But today, we're going to do a little bit of listening in the beginning. And then we're going to have a discussion, uh, which is captured on video. Please know that uh, you're, you're, you're on video uh, here today. And uh, that's so that folks who can't attend can access the website. Uh, the other two meetings are also there. So um, the topic is is transit-oriented development. You're going to get some definitions and some background on that. Uh, it's not a topic that most of us think about every day. And I am concerned that you know we, uh, you know, regular community members, understand what it is and what it could be. Uh, I believe that there's tremendous opportunity to repurpose the properties surrounding the light rail station, most notably the old QFC site. You know, if you're brand new to the neighborhood, you might not know what that means. But there's a large piece of ground. You'll see it on map in the presentations, which will be available for something else. What is that something? And I think there's some great potential. So to help us unpack these topics, I've got three uh, august speakers here with us today um, from three different organizations that have kind of, not kind of, they have different um, levels of perspective. And you're going to hear from each of them kind of from the general to the specific. So the Puget Sound Regional Council uh, is a regional planning agency. And you'll hear more about what they do momentarily. Uh, the Seattle Department of Transportation transportation is familiar to most of us, but there's a lot of work that goes on at SDOT, and we're going to hear uh, from them about uh, kind of some localized issues, because you have to think about the station and, and how people move from and to the station, um, and, and the things that should happen at the station sites. And then finally, Sound Transit itself is the obvious stakeholder in the transit-oriented development process, and they're bound by a variety of laws and, and policies that, uh, you know, kind of help define what does become of the process. So we've got some folks from Sound Transit here today to help us understand those things. So really, um, I'm going to ask Sarah Maxana from the Puget Sound Regional Council to come up. I'll get Sarah's slides up here. Sarah, maybe you can introduce yourself and um, talk with us about um, your take on transit-oriented development. I'll get things started. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm Sarah, and I work for the Puget Sound Regional Council, which is a, a planning agency, as Jim mentioned, that works at the regional level for the four-county 
uh, Central Puget Sound region that includes King County, Pierce County, Snohomish, and Kitsap County. And we are uh, charged with doing uh, long-range planning for the region, so thinking out to 2040 and thinking about the amount of growth that we're expected to accommodate here in Seattle. Um, and where we're going to put our housing, where we're going to put our transit investments, our transportation investments, uh, to make sure that we're accommodating that growth in a way that's consistent with our values as a region to preserve open space and to um, to create compact communities where people can have choices of, of where they live and how they get around. So I'll talk a little bit about um, the Puget Sound Regional Council in a little bit, but I'm going to start out, um, Jim asked me to talk a little bit high level about transit-oriented development, what, t what TOD is, just give some definitions and some examples of best practices. I've been with the Puget Sound Regional Council for four years, four and a half years working on TOD related work, um, but I've actually been before that was working on TOD work in Seattle for uh, another five years. So it's been you know pretty much what I've been working on for the last 10 years, um, uh, which makes me really wonky about this stuff. But uh, hopefully I can convey some of the, the high level best examples, uh, both in our region and around the country about uh, TOD. So at its Wow, don't walk close to the computer with this. Um, at its core, what transit-oriented development is, is a way of thinking about how transit investments and development can work together to create communities where people can access transit, but also have choices within that community that allows them to get to work, get home, uh, get to services, get to entertainment or other things that they need without relying on a car. Um, it's really about trying to create these complete communities around transit uh, that, uh, that allow housing choices and transportation choices. Choices. And it's really how our cities developed uh, 100 years ago, 150 years ago. It's how Seattle originally developed around its uh, trolley lines or streetcar lines. And you still see the imprint of that with our urban villages that we have today. But now, because, um, because we had a car <laughs> and the car became so pervasive 60, 70 years ago, our cities then took a different form. And so now we're finding with a lot of cities, we're having to be um, deliberate to recreate these types of communities that had were, were how our cities create uh, were developed on their own in the first place. And so the, the essential components of TOD, if you just think about the transit and the development working together to maximize um, benefit for the people that live there and the people that are accessing that community. So the two essential components are the transit and the development and what how best practices think about TOD is about the, the 10 minute walk shed, which is about a half mile radius around transit. And this, these are some images from the Center for Transit Oriented Development. They have a whole series of uh, books called uh, TOD 101, TOD 102. This one is TOD 202 on station area planning. And this is kind of an idealized um, uh, 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 imprint of, a, of what a TOD site could look like with that red node in the middle being the transit site and then you have a quarter mile radius and a half mile radius. You have, it, you have it intersected by other different transit means and you think about the types of development and the scale of development in those in the, that quarter mile walk shed and half mile walk shed uh, being very in various levels of intensity. So sort of the, the uh, poster child TOD you'd have higher density uses within that uh, quarter mile walk and then and um, a medium density within that half mile. Of course, this is all scalable to what's appropriate. Of course, downtown Seattle, uh, downtown central business districts, you would have you know much higher densities in those nodes. But the idea is really just creating um, activity in that space, in that half mile area, so that people can live there, people can have jobs there, you can have services, people can walk around. Um, but of course, we know that you know transit and development in and of themselves don't make a community. Um, you, you don't. You can't just put a bunch of buildings down and a train and think that that's a place where people want to be. So what's really kind of critical is thinking instead about um, not TOD but TOC, transit-oriented communities, and think about well, what are the what are the essential um, components of a community that make it a place where you want to be. And it's things like um, these two examples that I put up here. One is from a document that. Uh, uh, Two nonprofit organizations here, FutureWise and Transportation Choices Coalition, put together back in 2009. And the one on the right is um, a document from the Seattle Planning Commission in 2010 that both looked at transit communities in the Seattle region. Both of them actually use Roosevelt as specific examples. And so I encourage you to check both of these documents out. They're, they're available uh, on, on websites. But 
both documents laid out um, the other sort of essential pieces that you need in a community to make it a place where um, where people want to live, where people can have um, you know a thriving life, where where you can have people of all ages, from childhood to to elderly, living and having a good life there. And so in the in the one on the left. Um, the, the FutureWise documents talks about measures of high performing transit oriented communities and it's not enough just to have the transit. You have to have um, the pedestrian and bicycle connectivity. You have to have you know places, safe places where people can walk and bike. You have to have housing affordability to a range of incomes. You have to have the residential and employment density to make it um, to make it an activity node where people can uh, people can live and have, have choices of activities. You have to have a mix of uses. You can't just have residential or just have commercial. It has to to have both of those pieces, the retail pieces, the, um, the services, the activities, so that people can um, really meet all of their daily needs right there in that area. You have to have the greens infrastructure and open space um, to, to mitigate the, the denser areas. You have to have um, parking policies that make sense for that type of activity in the area. And you have to think about urban design and how these buildings are designed, how they interact with the public realm, how they make you feel when you walk around. These are all important components of a high-performing transit-oriented community. The Seattle Planning Commission's work on the on the right similarly looked at what they call essential components of livability for mixed-use neighborhoods, and they they. Uh, created a typology and Roosevelt fell into this mixed use neighborhood type. And they talk about breathing room. You know, again, when you're going to have some dense areas, you also want to have some open space. You want to have some uh, uh, wide sidewalks. You, you want to have places where you can still feel a sense of openness um, alongside with that density. You want to have vibrant street life. You want to uh, be able to get to the transit easily. Uh, you know, good, good way, way finding signs, uh, etc. Um, you want the transit to to be at the center of the act uh, of the community, so that uh, folks can access that, and that again gets to that idea of a walk shed or a radius around the transit node, and thinking about all of those land uses and all of the activity that's happening within that 10-minute walk of the transit station. Uh, you want to build a community for all ages. Again, thinking about um, from uh, from childhood to to uh, older ages, um, and then complete streets. Complete streets meaning that these are streets that are safe for all ages and safe for all modes, so walking, um, biking, as well as uh, transit and driving. So both of these documents are really thinking more about this community. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the work that um, Puget Sound Regional Council has done around TOD, um, sticking with uh, uh, Jim's, um, how he's laid out, we're starting with the very general level. So at the Puget Sound Regional Council, we're uh, Council of Governments, essentially, that over um, for the four counties, we've got uh, the four counties, 82 cities and towns, it includes both urban and rural areas, and we do the long-range planning for the region, so transportation, economic development, and housing and, and growth related. And at the Puget Sound Regional Council, I've been there for the last four and a half years, um, you know, we're really tasked with this challenge of uh, realizing that we are a growing region. Um, about half of that growth are folks that are moving here from outside of Seattle. The other half uh, from the Seattle region, the other half are children that are born um, to the folks that are here already. Uh, we're looking at a 36% population in increase. Between 2010 and 2040, we're looking at accommodating another um, 1.1 million people. So that's about one and a half more Seattles in our four county region. Uh, the equivalent of one, one and a half Seattle's in the four county region um, in the next 30 years. Uh, and with that, almost um, a 50% increase in jobs, up to almost 3 million jobs here by 2040. So this is a lot of growth. Um, and with growth can come a lot of challenges and also a lot of opportunities. And one of the, um, the, the central tenets of the work that we do, uh, which is umbrellaed by, the, by state legislation, the Growth Management Act, and then this multi-county planning that we do, is thinking about how are we going to develop? How are we going to ensure that we're accommodating this growth, that we're making homes for um, the people that are moving here? You know, myself, I'm included in this number. I came here 10 years ago. I've had two kids, so that's how, you know, one household can suddenly turn into um, three households in the course of 20 years. That's part of the growth that we're seeing in our region. You know, so how can we grow as a region 
in a way that preserves our values as a region. Um, as a region, we have uh, adopted regional policy that reflects the values of our, our community members. It says we don't want to grow into Mount Rainier and the Cascades. We want to preserve our, our rural, our resource lands, our forests, our farms. We want to preserve that open space, that wildlife habitat. It's part of what makes this um, this region so, so beautiful and so attractive to folks. And so we have a a central goal around development patterns, thinking about where people are going to live, that says we're going to we're going to focus the region's growth within already urbanized areas. So we're not looking to sprawl into the the green space, the the rural and resource lands, and we want to do that in a way that creates walkable, compact, transit-oriented communities that maintain local or maintain unique local character. And so this has been um, adopted regional policy for about 10 years now, and we've been um, making our regional decisions around transportation investments, for example, in ways that help support this goal. So we have identified centers throughout the region, and those centers are expected to accommodate more of the, the region's um, population and employment growth. And we make our transit decisions and our transportation decisions in a way that supports this goal. So, there are a lot of challenges with, with growing in that way, um, and there's a lot of uh, policies that are put in place to curb the sprawl and to redirect growth into our cities and into neighborhoods uh, where there's great transit uh, infrastructure. And so one of the, the programs that uh, I've been involved with for the last four years developed this growing transit community strategy, and this was really about trying to um, work with all of the jurisdictions in the region that are going to be uh, receiving or have already received uh, major regional transit investments such as light rail or bus rapid transit in some cases and trying to get um, all of those cities to work together to think about how those communities are going to develop um, and a lot of you know we're talking about very different communities from from Everett to Linwood to Seattle down to Federal Way these are very different types of places and what we were trying to do is to come in and say well what are some of the best practices practices out there for developing around transit and what are some of the goals that we can have as a region for the, for what we want to see happening close to these transit investments. And the three goals that emerged from that, the first was about attracting more of the region's growth to those transit nodes. So that's consistent with the, the growth we've, or the planning we've been doing for decades here. The second is about providing housing choices affordable to a full range of incomes. And this is really critical because the new development that we're seeing close to transit investments, the new market rate development that we're seeing is not very affordable. Um, and when we look at what the income spectrum is for folks living in the region, and then we look at what the market is producing close to transit, it's not lining up. And we're seeing that we have a deficiency in housing that's affordable to folks at the very low income and at the uh, moderate income levels. And so we want to really think about what policies and tools and investments can we place uh, for housing close to these transit investments that allow more folks um, at those full income spectrums to live close to those areas. And the third goal for this program was thinking about um, increasing access to opportunity for existing uh, and future residents of transit communities. And access to opportunity is a way of capturing sort of all the essential building blocks in a community that you need to have a successful life. So thinking about access to quality schools, thinking about safe sidewalks, um, healthy, safe housing, um, thinking about the, the open space space and the air quality. So really looking at all of those, we looked at 20 different measures of access to opportunity and recognize that there are some communities in our region with very low access to opportunity, um, very, you know, that do very low on those measures. And then we have other communities like Roosevelt, for example, with very high access to opportunity. This is, of course, this is um, relative to places in the region, ranking everything, um, ranking the entire uh, region by census block. So it's about trying to think about how can we give more um, housing choices in those places that have high access to opportunity already, those places that are thriving, and how can we make investments in the areas that have low access to opportunity, investments in schools, investments in sidewalks, to make those better places to live. So it's thinking about those strategies for these different communities. So as part of the Growing Transit Communities work, we looked at 74 different communities, and this um, this uh, piece on the right here, there's uh, copies of it available, thank you, Jim, uh, on the back and then downstairs as well. Uh, as part of this, 
program, we looked at 74 different communities in the in the region, and recognizing very much we're at the you know this sort of 40,000 foot level. Um, we're not coming in and doing station area planning or doing community planning. That's the job of the the local jurisdictions and community members. But what we wanted to recognize and what we were hearing from jurisdictions is, you know, a lot of jurisdictions are facing a lot of these communities are facing some of the same challenges, the same opportunities, and maybe there was a way that um, that my agency could come in and highlight some of the, the common challenges or the common opportunities across the region and identify some strategies that might be useful for communities as they do their own station area planning or community planning as you're doing here in Roosevelt. And so what we did is we looked at 74 different communities and we looked at the different characteristics of the place. So looked at, you know, do they have sidewalks? Do they have the transit there now? What type of um, uh, built form or buildings or densities do they have there now? What type of, you know, do they have the retail and the commercial uses? Uh, do they have um, schools and things like that? We looked at those types of characteristics. We looked at market strength to understand is this a place where the market is really hot and there's a chance that um, we're going to see some residential or uh, commercial um, uh, business uh, displacement as, as new growth happens in this community. We also looked at a lot of characteristics of the community members themselves. Looked at um, uh, household income, looked at uh, car dependency, looked at different characteristics characteristics of the population living there so that we could identify not just some strategies that are meaningful for the built form, you know, the streets and the sidewalks and the buildings, but really also what strategies are going to be meaningful for the community members that live there. Um, and it might be investments in schools, it might be investments in um, uh, 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 um, improved mobility to get folks around, really trying to concentrate on what are the needs of the people, not just what are the, what's the needs of the place. And so with that, we developed these, um, these one-page profiles for each of the communities. Uh, and the one for Roosevelt is there, again, just want to really emphasize this is not, you know, this is done at this very high level and does not at all take the place of, of community planning. It's really just meant to say, here are some of the high-level themes that we see in communities like Roosevelt. And so some of the the themes that emerged um, likened, likened the community of Roosevelt to many communities um, on the east side in, in Bellevue and Redmond actually because it's a place when we looked at the affordability of the housing here now um, it's it, it skews to the more expensive housing um, relative to other places in the region. And so it's not meeting the, the regional need or the regional profile for moderate income housing, for example, or low income housing. And so the what emerged from the analysis in Roosevelt was that there is a need to improve access within and to and without um, from this community and that can be done through improved um, housing choices that are affordable to a full range of income. Uh, it can be done through improved uh, transit investments coming in and out of the community. Again, this is looking at existing transit so it wasn't looking at the light rail that will be there in the future, it's looking at the, the transit that was there now. Um, and really identifying opportunities and community resources for transit-dependent households that um, that that uh, have a need to live close to transit. And so the the you know what really came out of this work is that um, there are a lot of again common common challenges and opportunities across the region and communities. And we were able to highlight some some high-level pieces and identify some particular housing tools that we work with the city of Seattle and other cities throughout the region on. Um, but really that this is just uh, kind of setting the stage for the, the real and more nuanced work that happens with community members like you and with the um, City of Seattle and Sound Transit and other property owners in the region as you're moving forward and thinking about, well, what does growth mean for this neighborhood? Um, and it's going to mean something you know, different for every neighborhood, and it's about trying to make sure that you, know, you have some of the, um, those essential components of livability and that you're building uh, choices and being deliberate about how um, how this community grows as as transit comes in. I think that's what I got, Jim. Zara, thanks so much. I think you're able to stick around as we uh, finish our discussion as well. I, I encourage you to pick up one of those large forms at the back. It's a wealth of information. And again, it's not intended to be the definitive explanation of Roosevelt, but there's a lot of good information there. I want to uh, quickly acknowledge that we're joined by uh, a candidate for Seattle City Council District 4, which is where we live. Rob Johnson is in the back of the room. Rob, thanks for keeping Roosevelt on your radar screen. Um, our next speaker is um, from the Seattle Department 
Department of Transportation, Kevin O'Neill. Kevin, I'll ask you to come up. I'll give you this, and I'll get your PowerPoint slide set up. Um, thanks, Jim. Good morning. Um, I have a really loud voice. I'm always really nervous about talking to a microphone, so I hope I'm not blowing you guys away in the front row. Uh, talk a little bit about myself. I'm an urban planner. I uh, worked for SDOT uh, for the last four years as a planning manager. Our team leads all of the citywide modal master plans. In fact, we're working right now on a freight master plan and an update to our pedestrian master plan. We also do a lot of work, thank you, with our Department of Planning and Development, including neighborhood planning work, like what you're doing here in Roosevelt, and also been working a lot with the Department of Planning and Development on the citywide comprehensive plan update, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, I've been a planner in this region for uh, over 25 years, uh, spent 10 years working in the city of Bellevue, spent a lot of time there working on East Link and stationary planning on those stations. That was an interesting place to do light rail planning. Um, and before then was actually with the city of Seattle 15 years ago doing planning at stations, including a lot of work at the Northgate station, which we're still doing with Mr. Enlich and others. So have a, a, about a 15, 20 year background in working in uh, stationary planning and transitory and development work. So SDOT, where I work, is a very large and complex organization that does everything from long range planning to you know fixing potholes and stop signs and crosswalks, et cetera. All of the work we do is kind of organized around these kind of core values, and I won't go through all of this, but really safety is a hugely important one that has to frame all of the work that we do. Um, there are 10,000 plus collisions every year in the city of Seattle. So it's a huge issue. It, again, it tailors all of the work we do on design, et cetera, et cetera. Interconnectedness means being able to get where you want to go, which can be very challenging in Seattle, as you know, sometimes, uh, in a variety of different ways. And then community, and then this sort of community vibrancy is really kind of what we're talking about today, right? Like the connection between transportation and land use and how it should transportation design, projects, et cetera, contribute to the kind of communities that you want to have and the kinds of land uses you want to have. So Sarah talked about the Growth Management Act and the regional plan, the city's comprehensive plan, uh, is a document that was adopted about 20 years ago. We're actually going through a big update of that right now. In fact, I brought some brochures I put on the table back there. We're having a series of community meetings actually right now on the public review draft of the plan, which has now been out for public review since July. So basically the city's growth strategy, very similar to the region's growth strategy, and that it's organized around a different tiers of centers, which are these areas in green. So here's Roosevelt right there, you know, right up against the Green Lake urban village. And basically the city's plan is to channel most of the growth in those areas in green. And in fact, in the last 20 years, 80% or so of the city's both residential and employment growth have gone in those green areas. The difference in some of the crosshatching is six of these areas, including the University District and Northgate to your north and south, are called what are called urban centers or regional growth centers in the PSRC Vision 2040 plan. So they're actually growth centers of regional significance, which are expected to accommodate not just a lot of the city's growth, but a lot of the region's growth. And not coincidentally, that's why as the light rail um, system extends, the, one of the intents is to serve as many of those urban centers as possible. And that re this really provides sort of the key policy framework for all of the other planning that we do and DPD does and, and other city departments do. So from my perspective at SDOT, really what I'm going to focus on, and I'm going to be hopefully a little bit of a bridge between Sarah's presentation and, and Thatcher's presentation, is station access, right? Because we're, we work for the transportation. But station access is hugely important in terms of framing the types of land uses and TOD you might want to see in your station. And really, what is access planning for station? It's really trying to optimize and leverage the region investment in transit and really importantly addressing what we sort of call that first and last mile. So imagine you live in this neighborhood. The station's open. You're taking light rail from SeaTac Airport to the Roosevelt Station. Unless you happen to live right at that station, you still have to get 
to your final destination somehow, right? And so that's really what we're kind of focusing on with station access. And so it's really about accommodating that access a lot of different ways, because not everybody is going to travel to the station in the same way or wants to travel to the station in the same way. So it's pedestrians, it's bicycle connectivity, it's, I'm sorry, it's, it's, there's going to have to be a little bit of a drop off, right? I mean, a place for people who need to drive will get dropped off at the station. Uh, really accommodating um, ADA and vulnerable populations. And then transit connectivity, meaning in this case, bus to rail connectivity, hugely important at a light rail station like this. And one of the reasons it's so important is because Seattle has had a long-standing policy, in fact, it's in our comprehensive plan, going back 10 plus years, about really discouraging park and rides at Seattle stations. So that's a huge issue for two reasons. One, if there was a park and ride at this station, that would be a huge land use you would have to accommodate at the station, right? I mean, you'd be trying to accommodate a parking garage next to the station, so talking about transit-oriented development. It also has huge transportation implications because since there's not a park and ride here, most people are going to have to access the station or will access the station in other modes besides driving, right? They're going to be walking, biking, or taking the bus. Again, for people who have to drive, I think there will be a drop-off, correct? But that will probably be, I would expect, the minority of, of trips to and from the station, although that will be available for people who want it. So we don't, so this, is the, this graphic here is an example from the Bay Area Rapid Transit Agency down in the Bay Area in San Francisco. We don't really prioritize different modes. We're basically saying we think all of these modes have to be accommodated to get people